going. Just to, just to briefly introduce Sally Ann, who I'm sure most of you know. Sally Ann is a dung beetle expert. She, she works across a number of academic institutions in the UK, as well as on a number of her own projects. And she's just told me she's rearing swallow chicks. So it's been up since about 4 a.m. this morning, trying to manage them all falling out of the nest. Um, you, can up, you can kind of improve on that, Sally Ann, if you want to dive into <laughs> swallows initially. Um, but I guess to summarize, um, she's, she's a bit of a polymath, I think it's fair to say. Um, so I think we're all extremely lucky to have her in what will, what will be quite an intimate session. We can all ask specific questions. If you are in the field, you can show her stuff. Um, but we've got probably about an hour um, to go through to go through what Sally Ann will present and then Q&A afterwards. If you are doing Q&A, it's just in the chat function because this isn't run as a webinar. We don't have uh, the Q&A function, which you'll have all seen before. Anyway, just why don't I just let Sally Ann kick off and over to you. Right, well, hello everybody. Um, basically, I've come on this to talk to you about dung beetles, both in your farm and out in the field and um, what they can do for you and what you can do for them. Um, this has come about because dung beetles are very much in the forefront now of people's um, thought, thought, especially when you're looking at pasture land ecology. And it's not just cows, it's, it's right across the board. So you're looking at things like sheep, you're looking at alpacas, um, you're going right across the board in all your livestock sectors, deer farming, everything. Uh, and obviously we look a lot more at cattle and sheep because there's more cattle and sheep done than anything else. Um, but this has been brought about from my point of view, uh, uh, from the insect side, is because we've only got about 48% of the dung beetle species in the UK that we classify as least concern. So um, that means over 50% of our dung beetle species are in a threatened position and uh, to, to extinct, basically. Um, so, you know, from an entomologist's point of view, that's really concerning. I also keep sheep and cattle uh, on quite a large scale. Um, and from a farmer's point of view, I'm very interested in pasture land ecology and pasture land health and the grazing that I've got for my livestock and the entire system. And I'm looking at pasture as permanent pasture. That's what most of my research is based around and it's cacarous pasture because that's where I am up on the uh, North Wessex Dams. However, this goes right across the board to your lays, to your recently sown lays. Um, and we're looking at also at mob grazing and different types of grazing and things like that. So um, basically, yeah, I'm here today to talk to you a bit more about dung beetles and also to get you to understand a little bit more and answer the questions because a lot of you will have questions about dung beetles. They're very much in social media. They're very much out there. I've done an awful lot to try and do that. Um, and uh, we've got someone in the toilets. Hello. Um, so what I want to do is try and get you guys on board and talking about dung beetles because I don't know as much as you about elms and what's going to happen and how much things like this are going to feature, but they are an indicator species and they're also doing you an awful lot of pasture um, ecology ecosystem services. So if you've got dung beetles, the most obvious thing is that they break down dung and your dung is broken down and it's gone. So that decreases your pasture fouling and things like that, which is really, really important, obviously because that releases more grazing for your animals, and that's you know, what we're all here for. Um, but also, you've got a whole load of other host of things they do, and they increase the biodiversity on your farm, and this is definitely a box tick that's something we're all beginning to think about now. Um, it's more so about the biodiversity that you support within your pasture land. So, uh, yeah, that's a, a very quick introduction. Um, I can show you a little bit about the actual gold beetles and the sizes. Can you all hear me okay? Is everybody hearing me all right? Yeah? Yeah. We all, yeah, we're all being heard. Great, excellent. Right, so I'm going to start with some of our big ones. So we have three different groups of dung beetle in the UK, okay? Um, they all live based around the dung. We don't have rollers in the UK. That happens when you tend to have more competition for the dung. So you, the iconic rolling dung beetle that you see on David Attenborough programs and things, is it's in the warmer climate, southern hemisphere, and it's where there's a lot more competition. So they'll come in and they'll get the dung, they'll pat it into a ball because it's the perfect shape to move, and they'll roll it off and they'll hide it to either eat it or to lay their eggs on it underground. So we also have ones in that situation that are specialists in stealing the ball of dung from those dung beetles. Uh, if you go into another area, the tropics say, where there's an awful lot more 
uh, competition for dung, you'll get dung beetles that actually hang on the anuses of animals ready for when the dung drops off. So it's competition based. And in the UK, we're Northern Hemisphere, there's not that much competition. So all our dung beetles live in the dung or just under it. Um, the group that live in it have got the most members, about 40 odd species. And uh, I'm gonna put one up, can you see? I'm gonna try and hold it still. Um, but that's, that's a fairly big one. They're quite small, this group. So I wanna just get you to realize how small some of these dung beetles can get to, okay? And you might think they're not much good because they're so small, but they are, it's all part of the thing. Let me just see if I can get this one. I don't know if you can see that. It is absolutely tiny on the end there. All right, so that's the biggest group of dung beetles, the Ephodemes. And then we have, they live in the dung. So they, if you open a dung pat up and you've got larvae curled up inside the dung, you will have one of those groups in there. They are really, really hard to identify. Please don't panic if you can't identify the species. Don't panic if you've downloaded an identification sheet and you really can't work them all out. Um, the main thing is that you understand what a dung beetle is. That's, that's the, the one thing I want to get across more than anything else because where you are in the UK actually changes the colour slightly on them as well. Between, in the same species, they can be a different colour. Uh, if they get a certain amount of food as a larvae, they develop as a smaller beetle or a larger beetle. But, you know, there's lots and lots of changes. And a lot of these species I have to put under a microscope and key out. And that takes time. And I don't expect you guys to do that. And don't panic. But the main thing is you recognise them. So that was one group. And then the other group is um, the true scarabs, the Omphophagus. Now, they live in the dung, but they tunnel underneath the dung. And in a tube underneath the dung, they pull down dung balls and they lay their eggs on the dung balls and feed on them there. So I don't know if we're gonna be able to see this one as well. Let me try and get that over here. Um, where are we? Right, hang on, sorry. It is just trying to get it open for there. I'm just trying to get it in focus. Well, it's rubbish, isn't it? Sorry. But basically these are the round ones. They're almost round. Um, you'll get them slightly potentially muddled up with the hydrophiliates, which we'll talk about in a minute. But they're the true scarabs. So if you think of the Egyptian scarab beetles, which you must have all known, because as kids, I hope you're all into Egyptianology like I was. There's the Egyptian scarab beetle. That's that group. So that's pretty much the size they are. And then you have the geotrupids. Now these are the big guys. And uh, these also live underneath the dung pat. They dig a big tunnel down beside the dung pat or underneath the dung pat, and they pull the dung down into the tunnels. And these can actually get quite big. So you can see here, you know, a much bigger beetle. And these are moving some dung. So it's about having a group of dung beetles. They are active all year round. You get dung beetles all year round, except for when it's absolutely frozen. You've got dung beetles out there. In the winter, you've got less species and less number of them. The population is a bit lower. However, if you don't have the dung out there in the winter time, ready for this early spring, we're getting these climatical flushes of temperature, or you get this mass emergence, and if they haven't got food, they can't breed, and then when you're putting more animals out full time, or, you know, they just don't get the um, ability to live there because they just, their numbers are depleted because they haven't had the dung early on. So we're gonna be talking about keeping animals a little bit out in the winter without being detrimental to your past animals, or talking as a farmer and an entomologist. So um, those are your three groups. Now you will find other things in your dung. Uh, anything, rule of thumb, all right? We're gonna keep it nice and simple. Rule of thumb is if it's fast moving, it's not a dung beetle. Um, fast moving beetles are normally predatory beetles. They're there to eat other insects. So if you open up your dung pack and say, oh wow, look, I've got loads of dung beetles and they're whizzing everywhere, Chances are none of them are dung beetles. The dung beetle will be the one that's quite still. And if you pick it up, often they'll play dead because they're herbivores, they're slow moving. They're, they're, they've got to do a different way of behaving if they're under threat. Um, so you will get hydrophiliates, little round beetles. They have slightly different color bottoms sometimes, depending on what species you've got, slightly different sizes, but they're absolutely round, they're smooth and shiny. And those are hydrophiliates. they are water beetles and uh, they've evolved to spend their time in wet dung. So they love wet dung. You won't find them in dry dung. Um, and then you have the long, thin beetles, sort of like, um, um, I'm just trying to think, devil's coach horse. Whoever's seen a devil's coach horse? A beetle under a rock, you lift it up and it curls its abdomen up and it has its large front. Those are road beetles, staphylinids. And you get a whole host of different staphylinids, all different sizes, but they, again, are in the dung. They're predatory. They're gonna be fast moving. And then you have um, things like hysterids. They're quite round and they've got really big jaws on the front. 
again, quite fast moving, those are predator beetles. So these are a whole community in your dung. When you think of a dung pad, think of a micro habitat. So your whole field is a massive habitat. Then you've got different habitats within that. You've got an area under your shady tree, that's a different habitat to the area outside in the um, full sun. You might have a bit of poaching by the gate and by the trough. That is a different habitat to where the cattle don't really run all the time. So you've got all these different habitats within one habitat and the dung pile itself is another habitat within those. So we call it a micro habitat. And in that habitat, you're going to have fungi, you're going to have your insects, you're going to have all your other invertebrates, you're going to have your decomposers, you're going to have all sorts of different things living in that area. And you'll find maggots in there occasionally. And maggots are obviously, you've got different flies that are problematic to livestock, but you've also got hoverflies that will breed in dung and they have a young, a larvae that looks a bit like a maggot. You'll have the ugly beetles that are actually um, beetle larvae of the beetles groups I was talking about a minute ago, they're predators. They will have their larvae in the dung as well. And lots of other flies like dung flies that will have their larvae in the dung. So if you see a maggot in the dung, don't necessarily think it's a bad thing um, because it might not be. It might be one of these other groups, you know, uh, hoverflies are pollinators, obviously. So there's a, a huge group going on. Now, when you have dung beetles in your dung pad, you have an increased biodiversity of other things living in the dung pad. And underneath the dung pad, you are going to have more earthworms from all three groups of earthworms are more active under dung pads that are being worked by dung beetles. So that is actually, if you think of the dung pat being drawn into the ground, releasing all those nitrogens, re uh, recycling all those nutrients, sorry, and then you've got all that activity of all the invertebrates underneath. We all understand how important earthworms are now. Now you start thinking of them working in conjunction with dung beetles, sorry, removing your, your pats, then you've got this really good microcosm of healthy pasture ecology, soil health going on underneath. And that's really, really important. But the dung beetles are the guys that are the key. They're the ones that if they're active in your dung and they're doing really well, you're getting more ecosystem services. And on them, they carry phoretic mites. So if you've looked at dung beetles um, or you've opened a dung pat and you've seen these little tiny pink mites, so pinky white mites running around, um, they're phoretic mites. They travel on the dung beetles and they use them like a taxi service, basically. They're too small to move themselves. Dung beetles can fly, all the groups can fly. Um, and they will move from pat to pat and they will jump off the dung beetle and they will sit, go off and they will find things like fly eggs that they can consume. Uh, they don't consume the dung. It's a, it's a symbiotic relationship because basically the dung beetles, what they get is more food for their larvae and more food for themselves because they can't eat dung that has gone through the stomachs of other insects like your fly maggots and things like that. So they want the pure dung that's coming from your animals. Um, so basically, yes, so dung beetles active all year round, three different groups. Um, you have different species that actually like the dung at different stages of decomposition. Some like it drier, some like it a little bit damper. They don't like splatters uh, because they, it, they can drown in wet dung. And also they've got no um, way of escaping predators. A lot of dung you will find probe holes and things like woodcock, a lot of the waders, lapwings, wings and things like that will look for them in there as well. Um, so they want to have a bit of depth for their dung so they can get away from those predators. And also if it's too wet, as I say, they can drown in it. They can't make the balls, they can't pull it down. They can't, they can't consume it. They're consuming it by sucking it out basically anyway, but it's, if it's too wet, um, then it's not good for them. And they won't go there. You might get one or two generalists, like something like fossa will go there, but on the whole, you won't get that mixture of dung beetles, which you need. And you need dung beetles in your dung within the first two to three days, definitely, for that decomposition to start. If they don't get in there at that stage, then your dung will sit there and it's got to rely on weathering to break down. And I'm sure many of you have got areas in your pasture where you've got that white dung pattern it's still there, still not breaking down. It doesn't even look as though the fungi and the, and the mycelium and things are in it. You know, that hasn't been got to by dung beetles. It hasn't started that whole process of decomposition. So it will stay there. Um, so yes, yeah, so three groups, active all year round, different species at different times, different species on different dung at different stages of deposition. Um, and basically, um, that's, that's dung beetles in a nutshell. So um, yes, over to you guys and uh, let's have a chat. Can we go over? We have, we have had a couple of questions already in the chat. I mean, you're all because we're not doing a webinar everyone you are able to unmute yourself and ask a question as well but i'll just start by 
um, mentioning these two, Sally Ann. So the first one uh, was presumably spreading dung late summer or early autumn can help compensate for not outwintering as far as dung beetle well-being is concerned. Yeah, so right, that's a good question um, and good good thoughts. Basically, dung beetles that you're after, the dung beetles that, that live in the dung packs will only live in the dung pack when it falls from the animal. I'm just calling it a dung pack, sort of being presuming it's a cow, but, but basically any animal right across the board, the dung beetles will only inhabit where the dung has dropped from the animal's anus onto the floor, that's what they'll go. They won't go for muck spread dung, they won't go, there is a small group that'll go into dung uh, muck heaps, but that's a, a different thing. Um, but they won't really go into dung that has been spread or slurry or anything like that because you've changed the matrix, you've changed the temperature at some point and you've changed the way the dung is breaking down and the muck molds and the fungi and everything inside it. So these guys are only inhabiting the dung that has fallen from the animal in situ on the ground. That's, I mean, that, that sounds like quite a, a big um, reason to outwinter. Have you, yeah. have you seen or carried out any studies looking at either dung beetle, dung beetle populations in farms that are outwintering versus those that aren't? Or, or yeah. are you, uh, kind of relating that to soil health more broadly? Well, what, what I've done was when I was mapping uh, a lot of different species, I was traveling around the UK, all over the UK. So I've, I've been looking at um, farming systems as well. And, and I've been taking samples from places like the Orkneys, you know, out in all the outlying Scottish islands, they farm very differently to how we farm down here. Uh, I farm very differently here than someone does in Lincolnshire and the same one how they farm in Wales or, you know, all these different systems. Um, and basically you need to have animals out all year round, but we don't, and I, I appreciate we don't. However, if it's a smaller population, there's less species, and a, a much smaller population active during the winter. So even if you kept your, say, your rams out, because obviously you're going to be potentially bringing your ewes into lamb, or perhaps you keep your um, a couple of old dry cows out or something like this, it's, it, you don't need as much dung on the ground. And that's really important when you think about, you know, conserving your, your spring fodder and you're talking about poaching and all the rest of it. Um, so you only need one or two animals out. That does make a huge difference because what's, what the problem we've got now is with climatical changes, we're getting these spikes. And the spikes in the weather means that, say, in February, you get a week where you could roll the barbecue out. And then the next week, it's freezing cold again. And what happens is you get an emergence of dung beetles. And if all the stock is indoors, then they haven't got anything to feed from in that big emergence. Um, and you will lose that big population when you turn your animals out en masse. So if you can keep a few animals out, and I appreciate that's, that's not always ideal. I mean, my system, we keep them out all the time except for lambing and the cows calve outside, but everybody has different systems. Um, but if you can keep something out over the winter, it will make a big difference to having that population of dung beetles when you turn them out fully in the spring. Um, and that's, that's really quite important. So Pat, there's a, re a related, uh, let's say, observation from Bill, which is that um, Pat's produced by outwintered cattle don't tend to break down in, yeah. in the same way that they do in the summer. Yes, that is, again, you've got less species active and um, you won't have as many species active right across the whole dung community. Um, so if you, I've got a, a load of dung cats that are left over from a really, really snap cold part we had in the winter, uh, in the spring this year. So we had this really warm air at time. I had lots of beetles out. My animals are outside all the time. Um, and then we had a really, really cold snap and it put all the beetles back down into the ground and everybody sort of went back into overwintering mode. Um, and then the dung that was produced in that sort of almost week to 10 days, that dung wasn't um, accessed by dung beetles and it's still there now. Um, and it's not going, it's just going to rely on weathering, which is, is, is a very, very slow process. So yeah, you will have dung left out as such during the winter but it's important that that dung's there for that big slush emergence because that's, you know, I'm sure, I hope some of you went out in the spring this year um, and you had a look at dung pats, perhaps if you've been on social media and everything, we've been ramping it up quite a lot. And if you look at the dung pats, you would have seen this couple of weeks in May in particular, where certainly sheep, even cattle, you know, right across the board, were just moving with these particularly gold looking dung beetles. And um, that's two species, it could be three, there's definitely two, possibly um, more, but there's, there's two groups in particular, or species, Anthophe um, I get this right, 
um, Prodimus and Spaculatus, and they have this massive emergence, and it's not uncommon to go out, pick up a, a, a sheep poo, and just see it moving. Now that is a huge number, and they can really move your dung away, so you need to have the dung early out to allow these guys to, to actually access dung when they come out that emergence, if it will have these warm spikes, and then it goes into cold. You know, it's important that when they do emerge out, you have some. But yeah, you will have less dung removal in the winter, but what you need is a healthy population of a mix of species. So, you know, bear with it on that front, really. Um, it does take some time to build up your dung beetle population if you've got a depleted population. It's, um, they do fly, so they can fly in from another farm and other areas. And that's why we've got the dung beetles we've still got, because they are flying around and moving. But their area is getting a lot more fragmented. You know, we will talk about the threats to, young, to dung beetles, and it's, it's not the farmer's fault, all right? This is, this is a big thing. You know, when I talk to um, various people, I always get told, you know, what can we do about the farmers? What the farmers are doing? The farmers are killing the dung beetles. You know, I don't put insecticidal use at the top of my list because it's not at the top of my list. They're equally bad, the things that happen to dung beetles. Um, but there is a lot of, lot of um, issues towards the farming community. Um, and I'm in the farming community. I'm aware of this quite a lot. Um, so basically, you know, livestock removal for a start is the biggest issue because that is absolute extinction, locally extinct population. Because around here, I was part of, uh, this farm was a dairy farm. And around us, we had at least eight other dairy farms when I first came down this part of the world. And we've now got one. Um, and the same as sheep, there were several graziers in this area. There's now two of us, you know, and that the removal of livestock is absolute extinction. So um, that's really important to remember that. And development and things like that have changed the land use. Um, so it isn't just um, the insecticidal use. However, you know, we'll get on to that. That is also highly detrimental to the populations and we've got to try and work a way around that. And that's not an easy one to answer, but I will do my best. Okay, next question from John was, what effect on rotational grazing with long rest period, periods has on dung beetles? Right, so if you're doing rotational grazing, um, it depends also on how far away your rotational grazing is. Very often it's in, in one big area. Um, and these guys can fly. We're not entirely sure on the flight pattern to dung beetles. Um, but it wouldn't be unreasonable to say that one, one individual could probably fly two miles. Um, so you're still getting them flying in. And also they'll be flying in from other farms to you. So um, if you're doing a rotational grazing and you've got a farmer that's now only, say, a mile away or less, then you'll be getting their dung beetles come over as well. So um, don't panic about that, that they do fly, they do travel. However, um, if you're doing rotational grazing, the dung beetles will come in and they're breeding in one dung pat. Um, so when they lay their eggs in that dung pat, their larvae will be stationary within the dung pat or below it. So the fact that there's not more dung in that field alone isn't a problem because the, the decomposition process of those beetles breaking that dung down is happening with the eggs, the, well, the larvae, and uh, with the, the um, whole going stage growing forward into pupation. So, and then they will emerge and then they will fly over to your other one. So if you are going to have continual dung in one field, so long as there is fresh dung being produced within a certain area of other livestock, if they're not just your own, but you know, in that certain area, then you're fine because the dung beetles will just go from one to the other and they'll lay their eggs in one dung pat and the life cycle will carry on in that one. When they emerge, they will fly back. Perhaps by then you've actually come back round to your rotation. Um, but it's, you will have, obviously, rotational grazing is a good thing to do in many respects, and the dung beetles will fall into that routine. There's research starting on all of this. Um, I don't have anything published on this at all that I can access for you. Uh, do have a look at um, Google Scholar and ResearchGate. They are the places you need to Google for papers on that. A lot of papers, unfortunately, are paywalled. Um, but uh, you can have access stuff through Google Scholar and a lot of it you will find will be uh, Australian and uh, Southern Hemisphere because obviously dung beetles have been a big part of their agricultural life for a lot longer than us because of the circumstances of their dung beetles. Um, 
Okay, so then perhaps a slightly related question from Fidelity, which was which is about how far dung beetles move. So if you're out wintering in a field at one end of your farm, are you going to generate any benefits to the rest of the farm from that out wintering? Yeah, because again, you know, you you if you're producing dung anywhere, that the beetles will be are there. Um, don't expect those big numbers. You won't see that huge dung removal that you see in the spring, but even if they're, you know, you've got them in only one site on your farm, as I say, they can move, as, as we just said. So they, they've got one place to be, they can continue their life cycles and they will just spread out from that point to other areas of your farm as more stock comes out or you move those stock around. So yes, that's fine. Okay. A uh, question from Elizabeth. Do the same beetles live in sheep dung as cattle? Yes, yeah, so you get generalist spe uh, species, um, things like uh, roofer peas, I find everywhere. I found that in deer dung on the tidal line of the river of uh, Arran, the island of Arran, you know, that, that salt water and everything. You know, you do get these generalists. Um, I've been to look at wildlife parks and I've looked in rhino dung and things like that to see, and buffalo dung, because people, uh, we, obviously we haven't diversified into rhino, but there is a guy who actually breeds uh, yaks in the UK, up in the Cairngorms, and we've got reindeer farm, and we've got people who have um, watered buffalo and things like that. So, you know, it's interesting to see whether our dung beetles will eat uh, dung from animals that aren't indigenous to their native um, uh, dung beetle background, but I'm trying to think of the right word there. But basically, um, yes, so the dung beetles, you get generalists that you will see on your dung, and you get also specialists. So we do have some specialists that like just sheep dung. Um, we do have ones that prefer horse dung. Um, you also get ones that prefer horse dung or sheep dung or cattle dung in the shade. And some that like it, you know, there's, there's a little dung beetle that only likes dung when it falls on bare ground and it'll just live in the interface of the soil to the dung. It won't go on dung with grass. But you know, you get these specialists, okay? And it's the specialists that are more in trouble than the generalists because obviously they're specialists. Um, but yes, you, you do get specialists. We do have a dung beetle um, that a lot of people, has been a big argument whether it's a roller uh, and, uh, in the UK, and we've come to the conclusion it's not a roller, and that's the minotaur beetle, which is um, a dung, quite one of the big geotrupids, and it has a, a three horn sort of coming from the head. Um, and it likes rabbit dung in particular. It'll also go for sheep dung that's in the round pelleted form. It'll go for deer dung that's in the round pelleted form and uh, what it's doing is just landing near the dung and pulling those pellets into the hole. So it's not a true roll because it doesn't make it all up. But again, you will have that on sandy soils. The soils affect what dung beetles you have. Um, but if you've got sandy soils and you've got sheep that are producing the pelleted form dung, chances are you'll have that beetle. However, if you've got sand sheep on clay, heavy clay soils and uh, they're producing a much wetter mass of dung, you know, dung, then you won't be having that beetle. So it's, it's that type of thing. They're, they're specialists and there's generalists. Next up, a really interesting, perhaps ethical question from Andy. Maybe I should be whispering this. If I want to look at one under the microscope, how do I collect it and mount it? Is it acceptable to kill and collect individuals I can't identify in the field? Right, so um, now I've done, have a look, if you want to have a listen to something, Google um, Radio 4 in the killing jar, okay? Um, that was uh, a piece that I did um, with some colleagues addressing the whole ethics of why we collect insects and why we do stuff like that. Um, I do collect specimens and um, I'm not collecting all the dung beetles, but as I said earlier on, for you to identify them correctly, you will probably have to put them under a microscope. There is no need to collect all the beetles out of the dung pack. However, you can collect an individual. Um, how you do it, I preempted this question actually. So you're gonna know a lot more about me now. Um, I love urine sample pots, okay? You can get them from your doctors or get them online. They're absolutely brilliant. At the end, you can drill holes if you're live collecting samples. Um, and if you're collecting dung beetles, so you've opened up your dung pat, you want to have a look at one, you, it's very simple, you can get all the really technical entomological stuff or you can do it this way. Um, and basically you get a little bit of kitchen towel and you scrunch it up and you stick it in your sample. I use urine sample tubes because they're easy for me to get hold of. Um, a little bit strange if someone ever nicked my handbag, but um, basically you can get anything that does that. So, what you want is your, your 
paper, your kitchen roll, inside your um, tube. And you don't want toilet paper because it gets shredded to nothing. The dung beetle will try and bury its way around in here. While it's doing that and you're taking it home, uh, it's cleaning itself. All right, now that is really, really important because if you want to look at the characters on a dung beetle, it's going to be covered in dung. Um, so it's busy cleaning itself and uh, you can keep it in there. Now, if you go online, you can buy, um, I've got it all locked up in my other side over there. Um, you can go on to entomological supplies and uh, you can buy um, ethyl acetate and you can put that, a drop of that in a jar and it will kill your dung beetle immediately. Uh, however, uh, you want to leave your dung beetle in that jar for about half an hour. However, there are various risks with handling that stuff. So what I suggest to you is you get your pot like this, um, when you get home and uh, you can get your dung beetle out and you go through, make sure you've got your dung beetle, he'll be nice and clean, put him back in the pot and put him immediately in your deep freezer overnight. And uh, that will kill your dung beetle. Then when you bring it out, um, basically you can get yourself a microscope. You do not need to get these really, really expensive microscopes. Okay, I need to, we are forming a website. Uh, uh, one of your members, um, James Allen, is uh, at this present forming a website with lots of information. And one of the things that we are, I want to get on there is places where you can buy microscopes and what type of microscope you need. Because you could get a microscope not that expensively, but you can also do your facial egg counts on. Um, and it'll, it'll help you identify your dung beetles. But, uh, and then you need to get yourself a little identification uh, guide. You can get all sorts of different things. Um, if you can still get it, Peter Skidmore does an amazing identification guide. I don't know if you can see this, of all the things that you might find. It's a key of all the things that you might find in your dung. That'll help you have a lot more understanding of what's going on in your pasture land as well. But you know, it's not easy to do this. Please don't beat yourselves up um, if you find it quite hard to identify your dung beetles. Uh, but if you can just get the basic idea of where it is, what type of soils are, what time of the year, you will probably be able to find out quite quickly within reason what species you've got. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically it's not hard um, to collect them. It's not hard to kill them. You don't need to take all of them. And if you are going to have a better understanding of what you've got, um, and what you're missing, then you do unfortunately need to go through that process. But I would suggest either entomological supplies uh, and, and going down that route, um, or just basically putting them in the freezer. But for goodness sake, do put them in a tube with paper and tissue uh, kitchen roll, otherwise you're gonna get a bug out at the end of it, covered in dung, and you're not gonna be able to see the little tiny characters that you need to see um, that, to identify it, so yeah. That's my advice there. <laughs> uh, perhaps what we should do, Sally Ann, is to put some of that into an email, in, in, at least in terms of the books and the, 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 the places that members yeah. can go to to get hold of that. Well, as I say, James is planning to launch this um, Dung Beetles for Farmers website soon. So we'll have lots of information on there yeah. where people can access. But I really don't want people to beat themselves up. They're, they're struggling with what species they've got because it, it's not easy. It really isn't easy. Um, they're not like butterflies, I'm afraid. Yeah. James, James is actually on the call now, so uh, maybe he can introduce the website a bit later. Um, a couple of questions. Well, we've had a, one um, introduction from Rob, who looks like he's a new member and, and a farm vet. And a question from Bill um, asking you whether you could tell us how dung beetles are affected by vet treatments and which ones are the most harmful. OK, so um, this, this, this is I've, I spend a lot of time with this particular question, and I spend a lot of time uh, working on different things to, to get around this. And um, I wanna say now, as a farmer point of view, uh, this, is, this is really a difficult one because animal welfare cannot be compromised. And at the moment, we don't have dung beetle friendly things on the market. And I don't know if we are gonna have dung beetle friendly um, things on the market or how you even create a dung beetle friendly insecticide because that's basically what these things are they are insecticides and I know that this is Crovex season and everything else for the sheep and all the rest of it um, so it's it's more about how you apply those things so basically um, all the uh, insecticides I, I am going to call them insecticides because that's what these things are these parasites um, are doing is they are killing 
the uh, invertebrates that are within your animal, whether it be gastrointestinal or whether it's on their outside, like the fleece flies and things like that, fly strike. So um, that they are designed to kill invertebrates. Uh, the problem is that these chemicals are still active and still toxic in the dung after it's passed through the animal. And uh, that's where the problem is. They affect the uh, cell walls within the insects and um, they affect various different things, but they are highly detrimental to the breed. They, they can kill adults outright because obviously the dung beetles are eating the dung. So if it's an animal that's just been applied um, uh, something, say, I was going to say something like um, one of the fly strike, long acting fly strikes that we're using at the moment, a lot of people are on their animals. Um, so if it comes into the dung, it's highly toxic. The dung beetle will be in there and the dung beetle is eating the dung. Uh, not those other little beetles I was talking about. They're living in the dung looking for other insects. The dung beetle is eating the dung. The dung has now got insecticide in it and uh, that will kill the dung beetle. Uh, as it begins to break down, the dung beetles are still coming in and eating the dung potentially. Um, it will affect their breeding capacity. It'll affect the larval development and it'll affect the pupil development all detrimentally. So it basically takes out that population. Um, and uh, this has been a big threat to dung beetles. Um, it is a case of anything with meptin in is really deadly to dung beetles. Um, as you go down the list sort of more to the old based type things, the OLE, uh, you know, they're less effective on the dung beetles over time. Um, I would go rule of thumb is if you've got something that's going to give you uh, an eight week coverage or a six week coverage, then the chances are your dung is going to have pretty be toxic for a similar amount of time. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of information, loads and loads of papers that you can easily access that aren't paywalled on the internet um, about the effects of avamectin, and they'll all be the same, that it's highly detrimental. Uh, so it is a case of you know, how we treat these animals, um, and that we have lots of um, resistance happening anyway. Um, so it's a case of you know, weigh your animals before you treat them. I know that's not always the case. I've got a worm, you know, 200 sheep and all the rest of it, and I've got quick time and all the things. You know, I know it does go on that people don't weigh their animals before they apply their chemicals, but you do need to try and do that. Try, you know, we blanket uh, to here. I have done lots of different experiments, either of taking a cohort, cohort of lambs, treating some and not treating others. Um, basically, all my data comes back from that, from an animal welfare point of view those lambs at least need to be treated. If you treat your lambs, put them in a paddock that you can use as a write-off paddock, somewhere where you haven't got the rest of the flock that's not treated. If you're treating at weaning, put your lambs in a different paddock to where you've got, you know, because you're weaning them anyway, um, and that'll be your write-off paddock. And then perhaps if you're treating at another time, any individuals, try and not blanket treat after that point. See if you actually need to treat. If you don't need to treat, don't treat. Uh, and if you do need to treat, put those animals back in that paddock where you had your lambs in, say, so that you've got this quarantine zone. Um, and also, you know, be aware that when you're treating your animals, um, that you can facial egg count. If you can't do it, your vets will do it. Um, you can do blood tests as well. Um, you know, you can monitor the, the uh, parasite burden that your animals have got. Speak to your vets. Get a, get a management, a parasite plan in place with your vets. Um, and think about how you're breeding your animals. You, we spend a lot of time looking at rams and saying, oh, that's got foot rot problems, probably won't breed from that ram. Or we look at a cow and we think, well, it's how it holds its udder and mus muscle alignment to its udder, perhaps whether we keep that one to breed from, or all these different things. Think also about parasite burdens. If you've got an animal that is permanently got to be treated, chop it out. Get, 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 get rid of it. It's got a natural parasite burden there that's too high. It's, it's, it, you want to breed from animals that have a low parasite burden naturally. Um, and you want to look at whether you breed your own replacements. If you're breeding your own replacements, chances are they are more um, resistant to the parasites in your area than ones that you're buying in. You know, it's all that sort of thing. Have a real think about parasites within, within your flocks and herds because that will also help you um, work out whether you need to treat or whether you, you can lessen your treatment. I've worked with um, various things recently, especially last year, I was doing a lot of work with um, bovine mites, lice, and uh, 
we found that tea tree oil was working really well. Now, you know, from my, from my research, tea tree oil was having some benefit on maintaining uh, lice populations on cows. However, I was applying tea tree oil five times a day to cows that are halter broken and are part of an experiment. So from the experiment point of view, that looks amazing. All of you should go off now and you should rub tea tree oil in your cows five times a day. It's not going to happen. Um, I know that and you know that, you know, it's, it's a different type of scenario. So things are out there. There are plants with natural alphabetings, um, um, things like chicory, birds for travel, you know, that sort of thing. These all help. Um, so it's a case of, you know, trying your best to not use your, your um, insecticide based treatments. Be aware of what you're using, how long it's going to work on the animal. Rule of thumb, if it's working on the animal for four weeks, it's probably going to be active in the dung for four weeks. Um, if you're using it for six weeks or eight weeks, it's probably going to be active in the dung for six to eight weeks. You know, perhaps you can move those animals away. Perhaps you can treat individually. Perhaps you don't need to treat. You know, just work with your, with your vets and think about your parasite plan. It's, it's really, really important because this is one of the big things that is affecting the, the dung beetle populations. It's one of them, there's many stresses on them and that's a big one. So um, yeah, there's no easy answer. I can't say, right, don't use this product, use this product because every product has, has an effect, whether it be a big effect or a small effect and the sensitive species are affected more than the generalists. Okay, and sorry, just, just to clarify, there are no known treatments out there that are... there are some that are less aggressive if you like than others um but they if they it's have, yeah. you know all parasite things they're all insecticides um so if the dung is toxic and the dung beetles are eating it then yeah it's it's okay. it's pretty across the board there was a question about um vets and a well perhaps a suggestion that they don't tend to think further than the livestock and rob who's on the call who is a vet has pointed out in the chat that this is something he's working on. I don't know, Rob, whether you want to give a quick minute or so on how you see this side of things going forwards. If you just unmute yourself, you'll you'd be able to chat. You don't I'm have glad. to. <laughs> glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> Yeah, vets aren't the enemy in this either. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Um, a question from Chrissy, who is saying that they've been farming land for 30 years without livestock and they've just started reintroducing livestock. Seeing the uh, hang on, hang on. No, we haven't been farming it for 30 years. It was, it was just lay empty for 30 years. Then we got it. And we've had sheep on there for the last two years and we've now started to see one or two dung beetles. I mean, you know, right. just very rarely. And wondering how long it would take for the population to build up. We're okay. strip grazing them. Um, there's at the moment only 20 sheep. Got you, got you. Right, so um, one of the ways to find out what you've got in your dung, a really, really simple way, is uh, go and get yourself a bucket of water or, or just a tray. I mean, these... These, these are... Brilliant, cat litter trays, okay? But try and get something that's light. You can get the entological tray, they'll cost you a fortune, but, or get cat litter trays. As long as it's a light color, or get a white bucket, or a white, you know, anything that's, that's light colored, plastic that holds water, fill it up with water, go and get your dung pat, or your, your, in your case, a sheep, sheep bung, and uh, just put it in, in the water. And uh, as it, as it um, gets water in it, it obviously becoming waterlogged, the insects can't breathe underwater, so they will make a dash for the surface. And then you can scrape off what's on the surface and that will give you an absolute record of what you've got in your dung. Um, and break up the dung a little bit once you keep getting things off the surface, break it up a little bit more until you've got everything coming to the surface. And then you can see what you've got, whether you've got lots and lots of those predator beetles, whether you've got dung beetles, and if you've got dung beetles, what type of dung beetles, or within reason, which one of the three groups. Um, that's the best way of doing it. That's, that's by far the quickest and easiest way. Um, and then you can go from there, basically. You will get different dung beetles at different times of the year. We've, we've established that. But you will also have dung beetles coming in from around you. So there will be a population that perhaps are just, you know, feeding on things like deer dung and things like that in the area, or you've got neighboring farmers. So you will draw them in 
Okay. Um, not many ovary farmers. Okay, so you're relying on literally the population that's coming in through sort of basically uh, stepping stones of things like deer dung and, and badger and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, yeah, do that, have a look, and then you've got a starting point. So you can say, right, in, it's go four times a year, say, definitely do that four times a year, um, and then you will have an understanding of how many dung beetles, what you've got at what times a year. That's your starting point. And then just keep measuring and you'll see, uh, should see an increase. It is, if you've got sheep there and they're on permanent pasture. Yeah. Yeah, they love permanent pasture because you've got a whole load of them, two groups that actually live and breed underneath the dung. So um, if you're going to power a harrow, chain harrow, plow, or put pigs in, you're going to disturb the soil and the dung beetles, those chambers with the larva and the pupil in, pupa in, they, that's it, they're gone. So um, permanent pasture is, is ideal for them. Uh, have you got native breed sheep? Yeah, they're so A's. Yeah, perfect. So they, the, our dung beetles are sort of the same dung beetles we had in the Neolithic time. So uh, they prefer dung, you know, certainly the specialists, they prefer native breeds because that's where they've come from. Um, more so than the continental breeds and things like that. Um, so basically, you, you're all set up. Uh, the other thing would be your parasite plan. Just, just you know, be aware of your parasite plan. Um, mm -hmm. And if you need to treat uh, something, if you treat the whole flock for fly treatment, then you, you're going to knock the population. Um, you can treat an individual. Say if you've got one sheep that you do need to treat, particularly, um, because you've noticed you've got flies around it or something's happening around the horn or something like that, then, then treat that one individual, you can leave it in the flock because 99% of your flock is still untreated dung. Um, okay. But if you've got to treat the whole, uh, you know, quite a few more, then probably try and move them away. Um, but if you've got, as I said earlier on, if you've got one that constantly needs treatment, think about whether you want to breed from it, think about whether you want to keep it in the flock. Um, because that will be your, your Achilles heel, if you like, for you, because you've got native breeds and you've got them on permit pasture, your Achilles heel will be your, your parasite treatment. Um, so we have been using garlic um, juice as a preventative. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, well, there's, I've got a colleague at the moment. She's working on the effects of copper bolusing on dung beetles in cattle. You know, um, we've still got all this to, to look at. Um, I don't know yet about the effects on things like that. Uh, I can only say I presume it would be better than, than an insecticide as such in, in dung. Um, so yeah, that's, that's uh, the best answer I can give on that one, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. No worries. Okay, so I don't know whether anyone at some point will be able to come live from their field, but we do have someone on called Tom who has sent a video. But Tom, I don't know if you're able to share your screen and show everyone this video of a beetle. Hello. Um... I don't know. Am I able to share my screen? How do I? You should be able to at the bottom. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you see that? Yes. Oh, brilliant. Yep. Okay. So it's a time lapse video. So everything's moving even faster than it was in real life. But um, I was wondering after what you said at the beginning of the video whether these are more likely predatory species than. Uh, Actual yeah. dung beetles. Looks like hydrophilids from to me, which are your water beetles. Right. Um, and that's quite sloppy dung there. So um, I would say you've got hydrophilids in there. Now, if you get in there and have a rummage around, you might find fossa and a couple of other species of, of photines in there. Um, it needs to be a bit drier for your geotrupids and your onthophagus. Um, but yeah, that, that will be your, your hydrophilids and they'll be popping out one hole, running across the top of the dung and whizzing down the next hole. Um, that's their sort of behavior that they do. Uh, you know, they're not doing the dung beetle type ecosystem services, but they are still a beetle. They are still feeding your bats and your, your um, birds and all the rest of it. So they still have their biodiversity um, tick box, definitely. Um, is that cattle? That's cattle that's been recently. Yeah, dairy cow. Um, yeah. yeah, very fresh. Yeah. And in the same field, there's there was kind of what you were describing earlier the the dung that's kind of gone white and not being touched. And yeah. is that just due to wetness? Yeah, basically, it's. It, I mean, that, that dung is obviously gone white because it's dried out and it's sun bleached and and wind wind sort of blown and everything else. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's it, you might have 
things move in next. Some, you might have an ant nest in there or sometimes you get something, you know, the, the um, pill millipedes and things like that will come over and have a, a sort of go up dextrovorous type insects. Um, but it hasn't had a lot of dung beetle activity in it and that's why it's still present in your field. Um, dairy cows are unfortunately not a high favourite with dung beetles when it's this type of um, sloppy dung. Uh, it's just the water content is just so high for them really but you've got lots of hydrophilias in there you will have them later on i mean dairy cows on um wet pasture is is just uh, really hard to get dung beetles in but they you know don't rule out dairy cows as not having dung beetles because they do um it's just if it's really really wet really really splattery there'll be less species present that's the, that's the thing and I, you can't seem to get away from that it's not their preferred habitat compared to beef dung that's you know a nicely sculptured tower of dung basically um, but you will have activity in there uh, and uh, you can get more. Um, I've been talking a lot with a Nuffield student that I've been working with, Bruce, um, who's over in Ireland. And um, he, we, he was thinking about feeding chop, more chopped straw to his dairy cows to try and bring the um, matrix of the dung up to dry it up. And everything. But the thing is, the dung beetles, you've got to remember, they're eating the grass second time round. Um, so they probably wouldn't. I'd, I'm interested to know whether they would actually go for his straw based dung if you like um because it's not necessarily the thing that they're after to eat they're after the grass that's been through the the animal's system or the grass and the other herbs that's been through the animal system and come out in the dung i don't know if straw will hold them it's not just about giving them a matrix to live in it's about their food source as well but yeah you've got hydrophilias there so you have got life there don't you know i'm not going to knock that at all you've got life there definitely and you'll have birds and things come along and bats and all the rest of it so it's still a, a biodiversity you know box tick and you probably will have dung beetles if you if you look um it's harder to do i mean you could scrape that up and a bit of soil underneath it and put it in a bucket of water again go for a light colored bucket not a black bucket because it just enables you to see the beetles and have a scrape round and see what's what's in there does that help you at all rob yeah Sorry, sorry, that's helpful to us. I think it'd be worth us looking at some of the other groups of cattle because this is high yielding cows on, you know, very rich grass. Uh, so they're yeah. likely to be the kind of loosest. Yeah. We've oh, it got. Goes, yeah, it'll just fly through them and come out the other end. So, yeah, I mean, that's that you've definitely got, as I say, the hydrophilids there. Um, and you'll probably have dung flies and things coming in as well. So you've still got part of the community, but the ones they're not breaking the dung down like the dung beetles that's and that's what you want that's the ecosystem you want but it it is a hard one when you've got those type of cattle on and in that sort of system there definitely but um you know box tick that you have got biodiversity <laughs> thanks very much thanks <laughs> uh, if you, uh, perfect yes yeah, you don't mind unsharing um i think rob the our, our vet of the group is now able to speak about what he's working on Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I wasn't on the toilet when I arrived, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I've been traveling from space in our I've, country. I've so. seen so many bizarre backgrounds on Zoom, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but brilliant talk. Thank you very much, sally -Ann. Really, really interesting. Um, yeah, loads, loads to, to, to talk about. I, I just mentioned a, an extra point of control there, which is um, lungworm vaccination. Um, it's of, I, I see it as a great safety net. Um, so it's just worth, that's often the thing, especially this time yeah. of year, that really the reason people are going out and overwhelming. Um, and I guess, um, yeah, my, I've, I've really tried to engage vets, which has been difficult, but it's, it's happened now. We've got, we had our, a regenerative agriculture um, webinar started last week and I've got vets and farmers now sending me pictures of all their dung beetles all the time. It's great. Um, and I think probably there's four main areas I've managed to engage both farmers and vets with this. And that's one, people are wasting money on wormers. Two, what they're doing is often creating resistance for the worms they're trying to control. Yeah. Um, yeah. Three, actually by overworming with the persistent ivermectins, which is the most harmful, as you said, for our dung beetle populations, um, they're actually delaying the onset of immunity so that when those animals are in production later in the life they're, they're suffering with lungworm and or gutworm problems so they're delaying the problem in effect um yeah you, have you been having, 
was going to say, you're having a problem coming in with homunculus contortus and things like that coming through as well. Um, occasionally. I, I, I'm doing a lot with cattle at the minute, so see, see less of that. Um, but yeah, and then obviously everything to do with the beneficials. People are totally, almost totally unaware of, of the negative effect and the 367 million uh, pounds worth of benefit that the dung beetles provide for, for cattle in the UK every year. It's totally, totally unknown about, but you're right, it's your, your work and others is, is really promoting it, so that's fantastic. But it is a case of working together, isn't it? I, mean, think, I think people, because we were talking about weighing animals before you dose them, um, you know, it's, it's something that doesn't often go on. People do it by eye because of time and restrictions and labour and everything else. You know, I found it very interesting from my work. The reason that dung beetles was something I was started researching and getting so involved in so many years ago is because it's a direct impact on, on the farming industry that I've grown up in and work with and a part of. Um, and, you know, I, I go and see things where I tell... The, the papers that we publish come back and say, right, this is how farmers should do it. They should, you know, go through their flock every day, take out the one individual that's a problem, take him away and treat him on a, on a quarantine area, keep it there for a certain length of time, then bring it back into the flock. And in that time, they're to go through their flock and check for everybody else. You know, I know, and every farmer on this knows, we cannot do that. It's, it's just not practical. Um, and it's, it is that sort of thing, you know, trying to do things that, that work management wise. Um, and I know, you know, myself, I've, I've had to treat sheep this year for a fly strike because I graze near a woodland and it's just perfect scenario for where, what they like. We've got lots of thundery warm weather. Um, and I've had to treat a certain mob of sheep, put them in a different field and treat them because I'm on grain cart this year. Um, I'm not doing a lot of other work and like, we need help on the farm and everything else. I haven't got time to check my animals every day other than a quick check over them. And I certainly haven't got time to go and check those animals and move them here, there and everywhere else individually. So it is, it is a case of everybody working together and, and nobody can do it perfectly. Um, but certainly with treatments and things, it's just people having that awareness, as you say, and, and working with the vets to have that awareness as well. Um, because in the past, it's not something that people have thought of. And when I was at, at I went to Ag Uni and um, I was also taught, you know, before you turn out, you blanket treat all your animals. It makes sense. They're all in the barn, easy to handle. And then you turn them out and you put them out on clean pasture with, with no parasite burden, all good. But of course, what you're doing is turning them straight out onto pasture and killing the first load of dung beetles that turn up. Um, but that's, you know, because dung beetles weren't thought of. That's the thing. So it's. It's getting that information out, which is what you're doing, what I'm doing and everything else, and, and working together to, to try and give people answers. And there isn't the perfect answer yet. That's, that's the problem. But it's a case of having, getting people to understand they can have a parasite management plan with their vet and, and work together to, to try and, and work around the blanket treatment. Although sometimes with young stock and things, there isn't that opportunity to not blanket treat it just depends and and as you say people are overusing now you know there's a lot of mature animals out there that probably don't need treatments anymore but because you treat the whole lot this time of year at this time you know and all the rest of it people have got into their thing and then you get resistances and things so it's yeah it's about everybody working together on this one definitely which is very doable Great, thank you very much, Rob. It's brilliant that you're a, that you're a member and, and contributing in this way. Um, there was a suggestion in the chat that perhaps you could pass on uh, your either your contact details or at least where other vets could sign up to your initiative. I think perhaps yeah. that'd be best done on the forum so everyone can have the benefit of that, not just the group. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've done a couple of Zoom. Oh no, come back. <laughs> Meetings with external vet practice. Cool, come in. Uh, you slightly yeah. cut out there. Yeah, I had a call come in. Oh, right. Um, yeah, I was just saying I, I can I can easily do that. That's fine. Okay. Fantastic. I mean, I think what we need to be aware of as well is that there is a move from from the um, from the conservation from the uh, community that I also have got my bum foot in to would like to see an outright ban on avamectins. Um, and uh, this is something that, that um, I've been involved in a little bit of discussions, but um, 
I'm, I'm a dung beetle conservationist. I, I love my dung beetles. I want to see more of my dung beetles. If we bring in an avermectin ban, there are several farms that, that I know will, will go out of stock because they're only just staying in it as it is. Um, and it's, a, it's very much a tool in their toolbox. Um, and they use it responsibly, but however, they do need to use it at this point because we've been breeding animals that we wouldn't necessarily have been breeding from if we hadn't got this toolbox, basically. Um, and uh, it, my issue is if, if we lose more stock, we do lose more dung beetles. So um, I'd rather people keep their dung beet their stock and have a responsible plan in place than not have stock. That's, that's absolutely how I want to be. Um, but I am concerned because if we do bring in a ban, if a ban does come through on these, these things, we haven't got anything else that works as well. And that's my big concern that, that the industry, whether they're going to look at finding other stuff, because if they ban it in the UK, we're a tiny dot on the map compared to the people that they supply. Um, you know, what, what I, I would like to see more research going into alternatives that work. Because as I say, we got chicory and we've got all these wonderful things um, and I've been trying lots of different things and they are working, but they don't work as quickly, efficiently or the same as, as what we've got in place. Um, and that's, that's an area that we really, really do need to do more work on. Yeah, I just maybe add to that. I think there's pressure building from other sectors as well. Uh, and if you look at, well, vets are actually largely cut out of this area. We've, we've let that happen. Um, and, I, and I think we need to reclaim it from a holistic and manage it holistically. So someone's put a message flagged up about grazing management. There's so many things you don't have to rely on the products. So there's a, there's a massive push. And I think it, it's incumbent on us vets to take control of it and say, you don't need to sell products. You can do other things. But, and, I, and I wouldn't want to see ivermectins totally banned because, as you've said, they're, they're really useful. Um, but, but equally, I want to see the vet profession step up and, um, well, manage it. I think you might have another call. Like oh. we've done with antibiotics to produce. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Sorry. Phone keeps yeah. ringing. No, absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, people just, we just need to, to think a way around it and how, how we use it. As I say, I really, really want people to put it as part of their breeding management plan. I think that's really, really important because there are, I've done lots of trials and we are finding um, parasites, burden, is, it seems to be going down family lines and things like that. So there is a susceptibility to it. You know, it's, it's just, just being aware of it more and being more on board with it, I think is, is something that people need to do. And, and biodiversity is a huge, huge thing now. So, um, and, and you know, people use your vets. You can't do it yourself, use your vets. You guys know how to, you know, facial egg count, blood tests, all that sort of thing. You find out even if the treatment is necessary. Great. Um, how much longer have you got, Sally Ann? It's, it's midday now, we'll just a... um, I've got, I've got a colleague who, well, I've got a neighbor who's come in to feed my chicks. <laughs> So I'm okay at the moment. Okay. Um, given that we were hoping someone would come live from the field, I believe John, from his latest comment, might be the person to do that. John, is that true? Okay. You unmute yourself. I mean, I'm happy to do a, another session where we can get people in the fields and things. It'd be quite good fun and be able to talk down with people as well. Um, I'm not hearing from John, but John, pipe up if you if you are in your field and you can use your phone. Um, there was a. Can question. you hear me now? Oh yes, John. Hi. Oh, perfect. Sorry, there's, there's a. I got lots of cow pats around me, but they seem to all have lots of flies in them. And they got orange flies on them. Oh, they're very small, a bit like Sorry. ants, but flies. Okay. This one's got hundreds of little flies all over the place. All going in holes. Oh, there's a beetle there. It's a long yeah. one. Long one, so that'll be a staff. Oh, they've just come beetle. out to see you. There's lots of fat ones as well. Let's have a look. Yeah, so you've got hydrophiliates there, the water beetles. It's quite a wet dung. Um, there's one just down on the side there. Uh, you get little, little parasitic wasps that will actually, um, they're little tiny black parasitic wasps that will travel down the. Um, the tunnels left by the hydrophiliates and the, the fly maggots and they'll lay their eggs on, on things like the fly maggots and their larvae will eat them as well. So you get those it's only, guys. It's, it's only about two or three, two days old, so it's maybe too fresh. 
No, 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 you'll get dung beetles that will arrive as soon as it, it appears. Just trying to see. You've got something up the top there. I'm just trying to see what that was. You can see them in the holes. There's a little beetles in. Yeah, I think you've mainly got hydrophilias. Are you able to have a stir around with your fingers? <laughs> This is why dung beetles were so understudied because we know an awful lot about butterflies and things because they're very pretty. But not so much about dung beetles living in dung, right? Oh. Have we lost connection? Can we? We may. The rural. <laughs> oh, gee. It's very warm. That's really <laughs> He's in his dung pack. I'll get you back. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. It's very wet, that one. <laughs> if it's very wet, it's, it's more likely to be uh, your hydrophilids and your staphylids. And certainly your hydrophilids would love it like that. Um, more so than the it's dung beetles. Maybe there's a dry... We love. Oh yeah, that's a lot drier. That's still quite wet. Can you can you just flip it over? Can you will it flip over in one thing or will it fall through your fingers? It's, no, it's going to fall through the fingers. It's too 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 fresh. Yeah, it's too fresh. Well, fresh is okay. We're not, we're not hearing you, John. Um, I don't know if I've got any fresher, any, sorry, any drier, but it's all very soggy. We need to get into the cooking. That would be the way forward. I think we Do might try. have to move on based on the Yeah, no, I think it's, connection. it's all really too wet. You, sadly. Oh, poor John. I'm, I, uh, I'm going to ask another question. I'm going to put John on mute and, not, and ask another question. Um, we had one from Fidelity about stock management. And mm -hmm. she says that they're organic and have been for years and have moved stock and mixed the species between grazings. She says, we, we've never had to worm our cattle, although we do still need to worm lambs sometimes, but they haven't this year, as well, she suggests as it's been so dry but we also move stock regularly. So she thinks that they can do all they can to not need to worm. Um, yeah. I mean, if you can, if you can avoid it, it, you know, obviously it cannot compromise your animal welfare plan and your animal welfare. That's, the, you know, I absolutely fully get that. Um, but if you can avoid using these things and that, that is superb because if you've got, if you've got animals there, um, the other thing that affects dung beetles is soil disturbance. So if you're using ploughing or after your, your grass lay or you're using um, pigs, um, especially in the organic system, a lot of people obviously use, use pigs, um, then they are going to, pigs are going to grub up and eat the dung beetle larvae and the dung beetles and the um, pupil, pupae. But they, you, know, you do still get dung beetles on pig dung and there still will be dung beetles trying to, to live amongst pigs, but pigs do like invertebrates. Um, and if you're ploughing or chain harrowing or doing things like that, again, you are damaging that soil structure and in the soil is where you've got two groups that have, have got their larvae. And also if you, if you do open up the dung pats where there is larvae and, and pupa development, you, again, you're exposing them and, and they will either get eaten or they'll just, just die. So um, it's, it's also about uh, things like that, your soil disturbance. But yeah, if, you, if you've got permanent pastures, ideal. But if you've got, you know, animals and you don't need to treat them, that's brilliant because it is a case of, you know, please think before you treat. If you don't need to treat, don't treat. Um, but I'm not going to knock you if you do treat because I do understand about the animal welfare side of things as well. So it's, it's responsibly treating and trying to work things out what you need to do. So it, on your inorganic system or organic system, um, the main, main thing there is, is treatments and also it's that soil disturbance. Do think about the soil disturbance. If you, if you, if you're chain harrowing because you've got dung stuck on the surface, 
you you you're actually take it is it is the same as using an avam you know an avamectin or something. You're you're continually hitting that population of dung beetles, um, and then your dung's not being broken down. So then you're chain harrowing more, and then your dung's and so on and so forth. It's the same as using you know blanket applicating um, avamectins. The dung beetles aren't there to break down the dung, so then you use more because you've got more parasites, etc. Cetera, et cetera. You get into a vicious circle, and that's the same with chain harrowing and things. Think about whether you need to chain harrow. If you're on permanent pasture in particular, um, you know, and you've got all that earthworm movement, you know, four times uh, the amount of earthworms in the whole pasture, so they all congregate, congregate underneath the dung pat with dung beetle activity in. So, you know, that's an awful lot of variation and soil movement and everything going on there. So you won't need to chain harrow. Um, and if you're not on permanent pasture, again, you know, if you've got the dung beetle numbers up, you won't need to chain harrow. Um, or, or do similar soil disturbance. So, so think of that in your scenario. Think of that that type of management as well. Um, slightly related question on stock management. Do you see any difference when cows and or cattle and sheep are managed sequentially in a rotation? Sorry, sorry, I lost you. So when, when cattle and sheep are managed kind of sequentially, as in the cattle go through and then a few you know, days up to a month later, the sheep go through. Does that affect either dung beetle populations, worm populations, soil health, or any, any of those things? So basically, you, you will get specialists that specialise in cattle or dung or sheep. So um, obviously your sheep specialist will be following your sheep around and your cattle specialist would be following your cattle around. But if you're mixing them up, you'll get that crossover of species. You get, if you've got cattle and sheep pretty much grazing alongside each other, you will have a, a larger density of species of dung beetles than you would if you had just one group of livestock. So um, that's fine. The fact you're bringing them in after the other, are you worried that potentially that you, your, your dung beetles for cattle aren't going to be doing well because now you've got sheep? Um, your dung beetle for the cattle are basically following the cattle round, but most of them are generalists, um, to be honest with you, that will, will live in both dung. As long as there's dung there, they're quite happy. Um, so yeah, that, that will make very little difference. In fact, that potentially will increase your species because you've got two different types of dung being produced. Okay. Um, a specific question from Bill about diatomaceous earth and does it work for controlling external parasites? Yeah, I, to be honest with you, I haven't really got um, too much into that because I've been so busy with other stuff that I've been looking at. I don't know if there's any papers on that or any work on that. Again, um, I would go to ResearchGate or Google Scholar um, to have a look. There might well be some information, but it's not something I can openly comment on because it's not something I've really worked with. I've, I've, been, I've got so much other stuff to work with in dung beetles. It's not something I've looked at. Um, to be honest with you on that front. Sorry, not a great answer on that one. Um, just hopping back to a previous topic we were discussing about um, taking specimens, Aideen asked whether slow moving beetles could be looked at alive and then released back into the field. Is that something you've ever done? Yeah, so I mean, if you, you've got to think about, you know, why do you want to know the species, first of all? Um, if, if, if you want to know you've got dung beetles, um, is that good enough for you? Uh, and um, if it's a red dung beetle and you've not seen it before um, and you've seen two blow black ones and a brown one, chances are you've got three different species there or something like that. You know, it's, it's to whether you actually as an individual want to know your species. Um, if you don't want to know your individual species, then just have a look at it. Say, yeah, I've got one of those type of beetles from that group. It's definitely a dung beetle. That might be well enough. And in which case, just let it go. You know, I, I will let the majority, of, you know, I'm only taking specimens because I'm doing data that will go into a collection that is a reference. Um, so I have to have a specimen. Uh, in my mind's much more scientific. I don't mean it's derogatory, um, but it's, it's, the, it's the field I'm working in. However, you know, you probably don't need to take specimens. If you do need to take a specimen, if you do want to know your species, um, and it's one that's going to be quite hard to ID, uh, then you will have to probably, um, uh, put it down if you like but if if it's um there is a certain percentage of species you will be able to id in the field and you just need to know whether you even want to know the species um they are quite hard to identify and you know nine times out of ten you don't need to know the species um you just need to know that you've got dung beetles for a start and then find it if it's one of those three groups if you're happy with that that's all you need to know to be honest with you so um yeah that's that's a personal choice absolute personal choice as to how far you want to get into it 
Okay. Um, we, we've obviously had quite a lot of questions on the, the kind of relationship between vets, um, chemicals and dung beetles. I, I wonder whether this is an opportunity for James to mention his website. James, I don't know whether you fancy doing that. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. So um, I, I got hooked into dung beetles uh, about a year or so ago. I was on a um, one of the kind of which Rumming's brother it was now on the farm tour, and Sally Ann was was talking about dung beetles. Got very passionate. I struggled to find information um, about how, as a farmer, I can help support them. Um, and what I can do, and there was so much information from Sally Ann in an hour, it just kind of went straight through my head and out the other side. And um, I then rang Sally Ann again, and she dumped a whole load of information of which I managed to maintain and hold probably five minutes worth rather than an hour and a half. Um, and I couldn't find much on the website, on, on a website or anywhere on the internet. So I got in touch with Sally Ann um, and a few other people who are interested in dung beetles. So. Um, Bruce Thompson, who Sally Ann's mentioned, is doing a, a nuff field um, related to dung beetles. Um, a guy called Max Anderson, who's doing a PhD um, and looking at dung beetles, and has done some work with PLFA members, um, looking at kind of the impact of grazing patterns and management, so mob grazing and things like that. Um, and also Claire Whittle, who's a vet, um, who does um, a lot with dung beetles. Um, and I'm basically trying to pull them all together to get all the knowledge out of their heads um, and onto a website, um, you know, a information hub for farmers. So we are early stage, as in there's no content at the moment um, because we're going through that process of trying to get it out of um, everybody's heads. But the idea being is it will be a, a go-to place for farmers who want to so want to know more about dung beetles so you know what is a dung beetle why is it important to me how do i spot one and then pragmatic and this is really key thing is pragmatic information of how to support dung beetles so a lot of the things that sally has been mentioned about using sacrificial fields uh which kind of chemical groups are less harmful for others but the really key thing is, is it's, it's not an academic site, which is very much theoretical and you must never use you know, drugs and, and things, chemicals on, on your livestock. But it's actually, what is the best I can do out of a range of options? And you might have a kind of a gold standard, which is, you know, I do fetal egg worm counts you know, this many times a year and I only treat individual animals. I weigh them specifically before I treat them. And I only, if I, you know, out by out winter stock so that the dung beetles can be supported through the winter and all that sort of thing or it may be kind of you know there's one thing i can do which is actually i've got a field just outside the barn and when i treat them as i come out the barn out of the winter i can just dump them in that field for two weeks and use that as my sacrificial field every year and then move them on through the rest of the farm so it's trying to give that advice suggestions even um backed by science and, and knowledge um for farmers to do the best they can um, so that's what we're trying to do um, as I say the website isn't up at the moment because all the information is still in various people's heads and not down on paper but that's something we're looking to do over the next couple of months as he looking at Sally Ann um, who, uh, who is a bit busy at the moment and has a lot of information in her head um, so, so it isn't always a question of Sally Ann getting a phone call so help help how can you I've got dung beetles what do I do to help um, and we can actually broaden the reach, if you like, of that knowledge um, from, from all the people that are on the team. So, so that's the plan. Fantastic. Thanks for that update, James. I think that's brilliant work you're doing. Um, I think we should probably aim to finish by half past. There was just a, uh, a comment just now from Rena, uh, who works at NEP. And she was pointing out a study which has recently been carried out comparing NEP and another, well, other local organic farms uh, looking specifically about dung beetles. I don't know if you've seen that, Sally Ann, or whether, Rena, you can give us a brief summary of what's contained in that report. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, so um, it was a, a student on a master's um, 
talk, um, it's a master's project that did um, this at NET, I think it was 2018 she did this talk with us, so I'm a bit um, rusty at remembering some of the details. Um, but it was mainly um, looking at NEP compared to a local organic farm. She took two sites, NEP split into three different sites, and she took two of those to look at the total of number of individuals. Um, so to give an idea, I'm just looking at some of the figures now. She, um, she did some traps and she goes through all the methodology, so you kind of, um, it's worth looking at the presentation. It's only about 16 minutes. Um, Total number of individuals in the southern part of NEP, which is the most wild, um, rewilded site on NEP, is 11,042 beetles um, in her traps there. And this was compared to the organic farms, which were about 233 and 279. Um, so just a colossal amount of um, individuals compared. So yes, that's 11,000 compared to 233. Um, I think she's gone on to do more studies on this. It's worth keeping an eye perhaps on her name and, and that. But yeah, real difference that looking at rewilding just compared to organic. So you can imagine that compared to non-organic farms as well. Great. Thank you, Rena. I don't know whether you've got any comments on that, sally -Ann. Yeah. NEP, NEP is, um, is a mosaic of habitats because it's the rewilding, how it works is, is the animals and, the, and the, the landscape basically work together. But what you get is a whole massive uh, mosaic of habitats within in sort of areas. <laughs> that sounds a bit stupid, but basically within areas. Um, so if you're running different types of livestock together um, and you've got sort of these various different mosaics of habitat happening, you're going to increase your diversity because you, you've got the dung and the different areas that it have lands in. Like I was saying earlier on, you can get some species that will only live on the interface between dung and soil, some that like shade, some that like sun, you know, um, some that like wetter ground or drier ground, sandy soils, all that sort of thing. Um, and you've got all those different animals and all those different mosaics of habitats in one area. Uh, you are going to increase your diversity. It'll be very different from a field scenario with a hedge to another field with a hedge, that sort of thing, really. Um, so, yeah, you've got, um, I'm really jealous, though, because at NEP, you've got uh, Mutator, which is one of the big deer troopids, and um, very rare now, getting very rare, and they've got that at NEP, and it's, it's well, if anyone goes to NEP, um, do go and yeah, see if you can um... <laughs> I actually really excitingly I keep a little herd of my own four horses just at NEP I rent grazing off and I had three records of mutator this year oh. since December oh. um, I love it. and they were adding to the three that were I think from NEP about a year ago um, so I think six records now there's probably more coming in um, but yeah that's the first time in Sussex for 50 years that they've been recorded so really really exciting beautiful, and they're just beautiful, beautiful as well so <laughs> beautiful beautiful beetle and um, if you if you want to treat yourself and you like chocolate um, I helped uh, Sarah at Edible Museum um, make uh, Geotribute Mutator out of chocolate and I think you can still get them so there's there's <laughs> there's a Christmas present um, but basically yeah beautiful beetle we have lost one of our best beetles in the UK, Coplus lunaris. It was a huge um, beetle, dung beetle, by in comparison to dung beetle sizes. Uh, lovely, lovely beetle. I found it on Jersey, um, but it's actually connected to France rather than to England, which is a shame. Um, and we lost that uh, a few generations back, and, and that is one huge beetle. And um, watching it move dung pats in Jersey, I watched a pair of, of these beetles literally just, just dismantle and remove an entire dung pat in a day quite happily. Um, and it would be amazing if we could get beetles like that back in the UK. You know, they, when you see dung beetles doing what they're really supposed to be doing um, and in good numbers, I have a reserve here um, that is 70 acres. It's now been stretching to 100 acres. And um, it, the livestock management here is based around dung beetles, not the other way around, but um, because it's a research um, uh, site, and uh, I find it really hard when I get students here to go and find dung with them to show them dung beetles because I've got such a good population of dung beetles. The dung is just gone and the grazing is, uh, is maximized, if you like. So, um, yeah, it's, it is really impressive when you get to see these big dung beetles moving and doing, doing what they're, they're here doing, basically, which is, is breaking down that dung. Um, and uh, at NEP, you will get a lot of dung beetle activity because you've got the ability to have so many species and having those species, mixture of species, will move that dung a lot quicker. But your geotrupids mutator, I am green with envy, absolutely green with envy that you got those. Brilliant. Well, I think we haven't had any more questions. I think we've managed to get through all of them. Uh, apologies if I've 
uh, missed anyone out. Um, but I think it just stands to say thank you very much, Sally Ann. That was fascinating, and I hope everyone felt they had a good opportunity to ask questions and get um, you know specific answers straight from the horse's mouth. And yeah, thank you, and we'll no doubt see you soon. Brilliant. No problem. If you want to do well, if we can get links of people in their fields, that would be really cool, actually, um, to, to, to see. So everybody can see different dung as well, because everybody's animals are producing different dung in different places. And we can talk a bit more about dung and, and everything else. You, you need to look at your animal's dung. It tells you a lot about your animal's health <laughs> as well. So, you know, get down into dung. It's, it's a fascinating habitat. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining.